begin. Uh, let me welcome you. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm so glad to see you're all here today. This is the beginning of a new series within the forum, and I'm just delighted, delighted to kick it off. I'm delighted to introduce the beginning of a series of conversations here on the Future Trends Forum called the Paradigm Conversations. This is a partnership between the Paradigm Project and the Future Trends Forum. What we'd like to do is help give the Paradigm Project uh, a stage to have conversations about its work. And I'd like to also be able to help do whatever I can with the Future Transform to help the Paradigm Project advance. What is the Paradigm Project? What are these conversations? Well, we'll start by bringing up some of the different people who are involved. Um, and also, if you'd like, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a link to our webpage, which explains everything uh, and how it works. Just one bit of uh, information about this. We're going to have one of these conversations every roughly four weeks going into spring and summer. Uh, and also, uh, and they're all part of the normal series. Uh, so you'll all be able to join them just as, as you can. Uh, and full disclosure, I'm one of the advisors of the Paradigm Project. So I'm really fond of it. Uh, and I do what I can to help. Now, in order to start doing this, I'd like to bring back one of our dear friends, uh, the leader and uh, founder of the Paradigm Project, David Scobie, the first of our three guests today. Let me bring him up on stage. Hello, David. Hey, Brian, and hello, everyone. Brian, thank you so much for the forum and especially for our partnership with you on, on these Paradigm Conversations. Uh, it's definitely, definitely a pleasure. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to have you up here. Um, David, um, tell us tell us a bit, first of all, first of all, what you're going to be working on for the next year, or is the short answer to this paradigm, paradigm, paradigm? Yes, it is. I serve as director of a national higher ed innovation initiative called Bringing Theory to Practice. Some folks uh, on the forum may, may know us. We've been around for 20 years. Uh, and our work beginning a couple of years ago, but really, which is now the center of our work, is this multi-year project called the Paradigm Project, uh, whose aim is to foster paradigmatic change in especially undergraduate education on behalf of holistic, engaged, equitable education for all students. We think that higher ed is at a moment of crisis, of, of multiple crises, of an inflection point uh, where we're confronting, this won't be news to anyone who's, who's uh, attending the forum, we're confronting challenges of resources, of enrollment, of students swirling, of faculty precarity, uh, of a loss of public confidence uh, in higher education, yeah. old Paradigms, old ways of doing our business have grown stale and ineffective, not only in the public's mind, but in real life. And we think that a renewal of college education um, to make it more holistic, more transformational, more accountable to the larger society uh, is needed. Um, all of that's the challenge. Uh, and um, the other side of the paradigm project is that the same moment of turmoil and, and intersecting crises is also has also been a time of great creativity in higher education. Um, that's a piece of the story that is often under told and under remarked, but uh, in curriculum redesign and pedagogy and racial and class equity and concern for student well-being really important innovative work is happening. The trouble is that it's happening in siloed and fragmented and disconnected mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. So this project aims to create holistic solutions to, to help develop in collaboration with innovators across higher ed, to help develop new holes of uh, new paradigms greater than the sum uh, of these parts. Uh, and we do that both within by supporting innovation within institutions uh, and also uh, by developing new communities of practice and innovation across higher ed by, by movement building, as we call it. Uh, we think that um, overcoming silos on campuses and overcoming silos between campuses is a precondition to paradigmatic change in higher ed. Uh, I'm sure we can get into to more detail about that, but that's that's a high level view of this commitment. It's it's meant to build on really important work that's happening 
uh, but to overcome the the disconnection and and sometimes piecemeal episodic quality mm, of mm. the innovation that's happening. Mm. Oh, that that's a that's a, a breathtaking breathtaking uh, vision and and a great ambition. And this is one that I'm 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 so happy to hear from friends. Um, we're going to keep David on the stage. Um, and so he'll be subject to your interrogation. But we have two other guests that uh, I want to bring on stage as well, two of the other uh, shining stars in the um, Paradigm Firmament. And let me begin by bringing me add to the stage uh, Professor Buffy Longmire Avital uh, from Elon University. Uh, and she has uh, an awful lot to say and, and so much, so much to add. Let me see if we can add her up here on stage. Greetings, Professor Longmire Avital. Hello, thank you for having me. Is is that actually a fireplace behind you? It is. This might be the best Zoom background there is. Okay, well, it's pretty good. <laughs> I hope it's not on down there. No, it's not. It's, okay. we, we are uh, Northeasterners who grew up in uh, yeah. apartments, so we have no idea what to do with a fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd, I'd be happy to help you next time I come by. Okay. Um, uh, Buffy, let, let me ask, you know, the typical way we ask people to introduce themselves in the forum is to ask what you're working on for the next year. And I, I asked David this, and he's he's the Paradigm Project leader, so this has to be everything he's doing. But I'm curious <laughs> what you're working on. Uh, what, are the, what are the big projects, the big ideas that are top of mind for you? Uh, so many things and trying to figure out which one takes the most uh, priority. Uh, but for the past two years, I've been working uh, as a faculty administrative fellow at my institution at uh, Elon University and really looking to change the ways in which we think about and we engage and we build systems uh, around mentoring um, and mentorship in what we're calling meaningful relationships. Uh, the interesting thing about this process is that we struggled coming up with a definition that would capture everyone. And it was because we realized that mentoring is just so personal. Um, and for many, it is shaped by the relationship that it exists within. And so we leaned into that um, and we I've been leading a 35 person team and we are in the process of running pilots, uh, developing frameworks. David is part of that team uh, and I'm grateful for his input and support. Um, but we are getting close to the end and I think we will have something really dynamic uh, to mm. report back that really thinks about the ways in which you become an ecosystem that truly supports and has mentoring and the goal of a mentoring ethos kind of throughout it. Um, instead of it being implicit, it has to be explicit. Uh, for me, it has not been just simply an approach to making sure just simply in all students need to have this, but mm -hmm. more so looking at mentoring as a, an equity driving vehicle, vehicle mm -hmm. for student success, making sure certain students are not falling through the cracks, um, and also creating an opportunity for our for our institution to think about the ways in which we are asking faculty and staff to pour into our students. And thus, we need to be thinking about how we are pouring, how the institution is pouring into faculty and staff and how we are doing that for each other. So not an easy undertaking, but it's something no. that I'm really excited about because it has brought me into a lot of spaces to have conversations. And then the other piece of work that I do is the Black Lumen Project. And that is really a restorative justice uh, mm. uh, it was born out of our history and memory work uh, that looked at our, our history of anti-Black racism on campus. We are an institution that was founded after the uh, pe period of legalized uh, enslavement ended. And I think a lot of institutions may sit back and say, well, if we're after a certain date, we don't have to worry about that. But it is important to look at the ways that systems were created during that period and how they have continued to push certain people to the sides, to the margins. Uh, and this work um, was proposed not to be just another programming space, but to really think intentionally about the ways that advancing Black student, Black faculty, Black staff, Black kind of community success should not be um, 
based on or put onto the back of one individual or a collection of entities, but that it really needs to be a sustainable thread. And so I'm honored to lead that. And then perhaps I'll get back um, to my research, which I will tell you has to do with using the game of chess as a way to help young people learn how to navigate racial trauma. Wow. I am fascinated by that. Have you have you published anything on that that I can find? I have not. I'm just starting. This is coming. I've done a lot of research that reflects the experiences that I've had and that my students and friends have had. This one, this research project is in honor of my sons who are navigating a world um, and learning the strategies of what it means to be uh, boys of color. Uh, oh and boys who are Jewish as well. So yeah. lots of identities, biracial, Jewish, multilingual, um, and they both love chess. And so I thought, what a, could I potentially take a chess game and yeah. create a pathway to help them talk about practice, navigate through the ways in which they um, can heal from racial, racial trauma and also just to be able to better respond to instances of trauma as well. What's the, what's that movie about um, a teenage black chess player? Um, uh, I'm blanking the name of it. Um, uh, who was involved in a complicated, uh, fresh. Oh, have I don't think seen? I know that one. I'll have to put it on the list. Oh, it's a great film. I was I was blown away by it. I'll, I'll put this in the chat. It's a okay. it's, an, it's an incredible film. Um, okay, I'm going to stop because I'm, I'm I'm happy to teach about gaming, so I'm going to stop here. Yes, David. <laughs> I just wanted to to know Buff. I mean, Buffy's work on all these fronts is amazing, but I I just want to put a point under what she was talking about about her relation, her mentoring and relationship building work. That's a perfect example on the ground of what paradigmatic change looks like that what and yes. what our project aims to support that what might seem like a single lane mentoring um has changes in the faculty and staff role and overcoming silos between them curricular change a deep centering of equity that cuts across the different the different spaces uh, of an institution and that move from single lane or single silo change to integrative change, which Buffy's leading for us at Elon, is a really good example of how the project gets lived. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Thank you both. Um, but this is not enough. We need to add a third player to our panel. Uh, let me just bring on uh, our good friend um, and uh, wonderful, um, just academic in all kinds of ways, uh, Professor Timothy Eatman, uh, coming to us from uh, Rutgers University. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Brian, how are you? Oh, I'm fantastic now that you're all here. Um, this is great. But you said uh, it's not enough. I think it is enough. Um, I want to affirm you and the vision of this work. I think I learned uh, so much about um, uh, Professor Longmire Avital's work that I didn't know about, um, just listening to her details, some of those things. So this has really been powerful already for me. And I've made a note that I need to go into that archive and, and look at um, what you've been uh, doing here in more detail beyond even the Paradigm Project. Very good, very good. Um, these are wonderful people. Um, in order to introduce this last person on our panel some more, Tim, what are you, what are you gonna be working on for the next year? What lies ahead for you in terms of the big projects and the big ideas? The big thing that I want to do, uh, Brian, is to have an increasingly offensive uh, posture and approach to uh, my prophetic imagining. Hmm. Go on. So all of my projects hang under that. It really is about um, being clear about how I find my imagination shrinking because of the bureaucratic pressures, because of the, the challenges that uh, are so prevalent uh, with it regards our political landscape or our social landscape. And Professor Scobie's invitation to join the Paradigm Project, I see as a part of my process of, of nourishing this uh, notion of a pursuit of prophetic uh, imagining. 
mm. one of the uh, one of the the kind of refrains of my uh, talks of late in the last year or so have been beware the shrinking imagination mm. because mm. at the bottom of it i think <clears throat> really um this is what we suffer from um, yeah the sense right. of lack when there is no lack or it's mm. lack because of how we think about it so anyway uh mm. i'm really uh, uh you know, trying not to be cute here, I, I, I do want to categorize it under those, uh, under that parameter. But my work as the um, the inaugural dean of the Honors Living Learning Community at Rutgers University in Newark is, is one of those things that I think helps to uh, put me in a continual position of prophetic imagining. W what can we create <laughs> in higher education that will um, press us towards uh, the discontinuation of overlooking local talent in urban spaces, of nourishing uh, the kinds of um, young people from traditionally underrepresented communities um, that that have been um, disparaged. Um, you know, how do yeah. we look at the power of resilience in that regard? So that work, mm -hmm. the Honors Living Learning Community, which I may be able to share a little bit more about later is under that. Um, I'm also doing some pretty intensive work, uh, Brian, on reparations. And so mm -hmm. when Dr. Uh, Long Rivital was talking about, um, you know, some of that, that work that resonates, I, I was thinking, Buffy, we need a, we need another conversation <laughs> because um, our institution has been part of a Mellon funded project um, that's called Creating uh, Just Futures. And that project is sunsetting, but now I'm on the New Jersey Commission, um, uh, uh, New Jersey Council on Reparations, sponsored by the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Nice. And so, so those are a couple things that um, you know have gotten my attention. You can imagine that, um, you know, pursuing the latter is 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 really bold. Um, in fact, mm -hmm. if, if I'm going to be honest, I didn't have the imagination myself that I could work on something like that. Uh, you know, uh, two years ago, right? My imagination shrunk into the place where I was thinking, eh, yeah, it's a deserved conversation, but let me work on something else. So that in itself is one expression of, you know, my own um, trigger towards prophetic imagining. But I'll stop there. Well, that's a, quite a point to stop on. Uh, I love this idea of prophetic imagination. Um, we have the, let me just, friends, let me just ask uh, a couple of our guests a couple of questions about their work and where they're thinking. And then I want to leave the, the floor open for all of you for your questions. We have a couple already in the pipeline and one more coming up. But I'd like to hear you know, what you think about this project. If I can begin, um, Buffy, I'm curious. David outlined for us a, a vision of the future, a prophetic vision in Tim's terms of where we can take higher education in ways that are, are equitable, just that keep the sector going um, and and really build on what we know works. But I'm curious, what? why haven't we done this? I mean, why haven't we just flipped the switch and realize, oh, here are all these great things we can do. Why don't we do them right now? I and mean, what stops us from realizing these visions? Yes. It's this interesting thing where change is celebrated, but also change is resisted at mm -hmm. every <laughs> at every step. Uh, and I think part of our role in this group and the space that we've created has been thinking about exactly that. What is it that is driving our resistance as a, as an institution um, to and as a system to change. Um, I come to this work as a behavioral kind of critical health psychologist. That was my initial training. Um, and so I spent a lot of time working with and studying why people change, even when they have all this information in front of them that the behavior that they're engaging in is just not what it needs to be and is not going to have a desired outcome that they want, what is it that still prevents them from taking that step um, to change? And sometimes you can only get there through a process called motivational interviewing, where you're sitting down and you're actually helping a person kind of piece through, work through their life and work through their behaviors to kind of figure out why exactly are they not doing what they are saying they want uh, to do. And sometimes 
from a behavioral health perspective, a lot of times it comes down to bias. I think that you can apply that to higher education as well. How are we biased in our thinking? How are we engaging in things like confirmation bias? So mm, yes. speaking out um, uh, um, directions and initiatives that appear new, but we know are just going to confirm what we already know. We are driven by social norms. Uh, I think that they're, when I started going to school uh, or looking, started my journey in higher education, I think I remember a big book that I looked through to get kind of profiles of colleges, but I wasn't yeah. thinking about yeah. rankings and all of those things. And I, yeah. I live in a world now where we're thinking about where are you ranked here and where are you ranked here and peers and aspirants. And we're always trying to kind of see what the other institution is doing One wants to I think there's a fear, a general fear of making a, a pivot and recognizing that no one else is behind you. Uh, and what does that mean when we're so often defined as how we compare to others? So we both want innovation, but we also want to clearly be defined and and to uh, have that point of comparison um, to others. It's part of our habit and our routine. Uh, and I think we need to think about that. I think we need to think about the ways in which we promote leaders, um, affirm creativity or not, um, is in very similar um, similar ways and has been for a very long time. And so all of these factors, the emotional connections that we have, the nostalgia the idea, I think that there's a, a luring trap. Uh, nostalgia is like a Venus flytrap, right? Like huh. it, it lures you in. Um, and I, I mean, think about the current state, right? Uh, of, you know, a previous administration, what is rising kind of, again, this notion of, of going back, this nostalgia, hmm. which, again. Um, yeah, consider a, a Venus, uh, a Venus flytrap. And we also, we've talked a lot in our group in our conversations about the importance of acknowledging power um, and that often the the individuals or the entities that are pushing for the change are not the individuals and the entities that are empowered to create that sustainable change or they're pushing up against you know that business as usual which then absorbs whatever they're trying to do and remakes it into um, that which sustains the system as as we know it. Um, change is an unknown. Uh, and it can mean I think it's uh, perfect that I'm wearing a butterfly because, you know, butterfly symbols metamorphose. Um, you really do have to shed in many ways those elements of yourself to make room for what is new. And it's in making room for that that you soar. Um, but there is fear. And I think we have to acknowledge that emotional fear uh, and and weave that into the process. There's probably even a grief that's coming from the fact mm. that you can't just so easily rely mm. on the things that you always rely on. And David mentioned all the areas that are contributing to why the time is now. And I would say that many of those things are also why we don't want to change as well. Nostalgia Could. often means pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and loss. People are afraid of losing. Yeah. Brian, could I piggyback on? Uh, Please on do. This? Please do. Um, so it, Buffy's eloquently describing how current relationships, the relationships of self-protectiveness, of competition, um, a fear of losing what we have, which some of the folks in chat have have noted. Um, you know, even while even while we recognize this challenging moment, keep us from undertaking change. One of the one of the assumptions of the paradigm project is that the way to overcome that is through collective, collaborative, iterative work. So it, it may sound to folks listening to us that we're saying, here's a big grandiose vision, adopt it. Um, and that's not what we're saying. We're saying um, Let's have a shared sense of purpose in student learning and student thriving and education as the public good and faculty and staff thriving. Not assume that we have a utopian package or some capital B blueprint, but build a movement 
within institutions and across institutions that change those relationships. So um, we're launching an institutional change makers network. We have projects in which institutions, different emerging model institutions are, are working together. So our, our assumption isn't that we have the capital A answer. It's just the opposite. It's that collectively in higher ed, there is the shared creativity to create new holes, new equitable regimes greater than the sum of their parts. If we can mm -hmm. overcome these barriers to change that that uh, and build new new collaborations, new relationships that mm -hmm. uh, that overcome what Buffy was talking about. Indeed, Buffy. Thank you. This is this is that's a that's a terrific uh, analysis of this. Uh, in response, in the chat, uh, Meredith Goldsmith says, "You're reminding me of how dropping out of the rankings discussion seems to have fizzled. Uh, too risky to be out in front without comparison." And P.S. She loves your Venus flytrap metaphor. I think she says she loves the metaphor. I think that's what she's referring to. Um, oh, this is thank you, thank you. Well, let, let's turn this around. Um, you know, in terms of why we don't change or the difficulty we have in changing. Tim, can can you describe a bit about the about the work you're doing at Rutgers as an example of positive change? Brian, in the last ten years, Rutgers University Newark has seen an eighty that's eight zero eighty percent increase of Newark residents who are at Rutgers University Newark. Hmm. Huh. That's no joke. Wow. And it's not only because of the work of the honors living learning community, it's really about an institutional mindset that has shifted, that is uh, communicating in a different way um, the regard for uh, knowledge making that we talk about as publicly engaged. And the honors living learning community rises up out of the strategic plan of, of the, the chancellor, current chancellor, Nancy Cantor, who's sadly leaving us and going to uh, Hunter College, CUNY. Um, but the idea really was, you know, how do we stop overlooking local talent? <laughs> you know, how do we as a public institution That's live up to our mission? And, yeah. um, you know, how do we uh, think about uh, the epistemology of knowledge making in a more savvy and robust way, such that we have cohorts of 80 students each year, Brian, 50 of which are just out of high school, 17, 18 year olds, but 30 mm -hmm. that are transfer students. And so mm -hmm. last May, we graduated a 65 year old who lived Whoa. for two years in the honors living learning community with 17, wow. right? It's one of the reasons I have this nervous twitch because I got 35 year olds and 70 year olds <laughs> together, right? <laughs> but um, we think that it's a kind of a, a paradigmatic shift to think about bringing parents and veterans and you know students who you know um, age out of the foster care system and immigrants and folks who, uh, in the words of Newark's Mayor Raz Baraka have overcome the school to prison pipeline. I love that mm -hmm. framing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, returning citizens. Uh, we've had more than five uh, young people graduate from the uh, Honors Living Learning community uh, that um, spent time, um, serious time, wow. that, they, that they wouldn't have spent if they were the governor's uh, uh, nephew or niece. Sure. Right? Um, off of stuff that is now legal, right? Right. So, I mean, we, we don't we don't need to, to go into that. But the HLLC is a space for shifting the way that we think about what some of these capacities are. I will just say, because I'm thinking of him, one of those students I just named and I, he wouldn't be embarrassed by by me suggesting uh, and even calling his name, Tyreek Rolone, who spent time in and graduated from our, our program, is now the director of workforce development for the city of Newark. Mm. Right. Wow. Yeah. What a great story. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, these are the kinds of things that sort of make me giddy and, and you know, make me um, um, sensitive to not only shrinking imagination, but the the gains, the, the harvesting of prophetic imagining, of touching um, young lives, right, that 
um, that just need a little help, just like anybody does, right? And 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 seeing them as as um, you know worthy of the kind of investment um, that 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 um, that that will lead to. So our work at the HLLC uh, really is about uh, trying to elevate the notion of what institutions can do. It means that we have to make some changes in the way that we do a lot of different things uh, at our institution with respect to financial aid, to regard undocumented students with you know respect to a whole bunch of issues. But we think that we in academe have the intellectual uh, acumen and wherewithal to do that. And so we're excited about um, you know, the HLOC note is not a formal exemplar project. It is in the uh, flow of the bringing theory to practice paradigm projects. And we're always in conversation about uh, how, as David so, so eloquently said, you know, we can uh, move beyond the silo mentality. Um, you know, my, my charge was to lead the development of, um, you know, a, a, uh, the creation of a, a national model. And so we fail if HLFC is only at Rutgers Newark. No, 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 that makes sense. That makes sense. You've got, so you're, you're, it, it sounds like in part you're drawing on uh, mentoring from, uh, from, from Buffy's work, but at the same time you're grounding that in the media community, uh, trying again to, to look for that spread of knowledge creation. Uh, friends, oh, no, let me stop 100%. talking. I'll just I, say I, quickly, just really quickly, um, the the high impact practices, you know, uh, for student success, evidentiary base informs all of the work that we're doing, and so we know that mentoring is an important part of that, you know, um, as as are all all ten of the others. Um, but you know, it, it's important to note that we're creating new high impact practices, right? Because we're thinking about, and I think this is what par the paradigm project is about, right? Recognizing how we have to be more capacious and more expansive even as it regards the evidentiary base that we have on our institutional model. So this is, and, and the Paradigm Project can take this and show this to other people and inspire them based on this real world example. Uh, yes, in, in part of what we do uh, is lift up exemplars exactly like this. And, and I, I put a link to Tim's HLLC program, which is amazing. In, in chat. It's a perfect mm -hmm. example of the kind of integrative change we're talking about. Indeed. Indeed. Well, thank you for sharing that, Tim. This is great stuff. Um, let, let me let me bring in some of the questions that have that have come in. Uh, this is one from our, our dear friend, George Station, California State Monterey. Uh, and uh, and he asks uh, a very a typically uh, very, very uh, powerful question. Um, what gives you all hope for a slowly growing participatory change movement as austerity-driven shrinkages seem so omnipresent and overwhelming? This is a crucial question that, that we grapple with, and I'll, I'll give a couple different uh, answers. Um, one is that uh, we, uh, we have, uh, we're partnering with a lot of voices and all the Tim Eatman at Rutgers Newark has never said it in quite this way. Rutgers Newark faces these, you know, Rutgers University of Newark faces these challenges in which people come to us and say, it's precisely because we're facing enrollment cliffs or budget cuts or equity gaps that we need to not go the way of zero sum budget battles uh, and shrinkage, like material and imagination shrinkage. And there's so, the, this moment of precarity is a moment in which we can choose to respond with hope and energy. Uh, and one of the things that, one of the kind of bywords of the project is, it's not a choice between sticking with what we have, is, as troubling as that may be, and bad change that's coming. Change is coming. Um, we're, in, we're in the middle of an inflection point. Let's shape the kind of new academy we want or else it will, the change mm. will happen to us. Um, and that work can be really mm. joyous mm. and give you energy. But so that, that's not meant to sugarcoat uh, George's question, but those are some of the ways we think about it. If I can just jump in, I would say, Please. I also just want to say that I think we've been intentional about think, uh, talking about and lifting up the fact that for some, there's not ever been a, play, a time of real privilege and easy access. And 
wonderful dynamic things have happened um, as a point of uh, the, having the audacity to try and survive and not thrive in in completely inhospitable um, inhospitable settings. And so, I think the beauty of this project is it also gives us an opportunity to recenter who we hold as exemplars and who are the the what are the programs the the approaches that we should be truly um, learning from instead of uh, saying that you have to adapt to whatever this kind of traditional celebrated um, approach is. And so I, I think the hope for me la it resides in the fact that um, for many of us, this is not new. This is ongoing. Um, and there appears to be opportunities and momentum thinking about the Paradigm Project to to support the work that I was going to do anyways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to see more people who look like me in, in spaces and I'm not as committed to these systems because the systems have never been committed or loved to be back. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of, there's a leap of faith in doing this. A leap of faith and some, for some, a leap of survival. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 would, I just have to come uh, along and celebrate what Buffy has said and punctuated um, with, um, you know, th this, this, is, this is the legacy I walk in, right? My ancestors, <laughs> you know, uh, right, no choice, right? And so um, where am I finding hope? One is, um, you know, <clears throat> the uh, privilege of of having the opportunity to contribute to what my ancestors put out there, right? Uh, in, in the context of that legacy, right? Number one. Number two, when you get to be on a, uh, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a network with folks like David and, and Buffy and, and, you know, Mary Dana Hinton and Paul Shadowall, I mean, you know, like the way that we do this thing, do you understand what I'm saying? Right. It, it, it has, has a, a penchant, right, towards the intentionality around relationship. Does that make sense? I know of, like people like, uh, whatever, relationship. Yeah, fine. I'm saying that <laughs> the when we get in those spaces, Brian, and you know it because you've been there, right? There is a, uh, uh, you know, um, yeah. can you think of, of Kate and, and Tessa and, and, you know, the way that we have, uh, you know, shaped, you know, Todd, the way that we've shaped, Jillian, we've shaped these spaces, right, intentionally so that they can push us out of the, the sort of uh, normative in, entrenched dysfunctions of the way we even do business, right, and how we intersperse uh, different approaches for uh, for breathing, frankly, the, the kind of, of, of breathing mm. that, that is so necessary. So, I'm sorry, Buffy got me activated when she when she started <laughs> talking about- We do this to each uh, other. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. You do this for everyone. Uh, in, 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 the, in the chat, George Station follows up by saying, uh, Buffy's comment really hits home. We, we get periodic reminders of uh, not being left back. Uh, and he adds, we happen to be in a period where folks aren't pretending otherwise. Uh, a really good point. Um, thank you, thank you, Tim. Um, uh, so, if you're new to the forum, friends, that's an example of a of a Q and A box question. Now we have an example of a video question uh, from uh, our friend Meredith Goldsmith. So let me bring her up on stage. I think Brian is showing off, y'all. Uh, Hi, just all of you. Hello, hello, Meredith. Hi, thank you. This is tremendous discussion, and I am happy to be a member of the choir on this one. Um, I just wanted to ask quickly, I was just on a call about a book called Mending Education that's about the fact that a lot of the pandemic related changes to teaching actually worked and that they were all about relationships with students and yet they haven't been adopted. The vast majority haven't been adopted over the long term. So I think this is a question that I have for you and it, it's how do you get people to acknowledge that something is actually working and it's actually something simple? Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Who, who wants to tackle that one? Good question. Um, I'll I'll take a, a 
quick swing at it. Some of it is is common sense. Uh, you know, we we put out a biweekly newsletter called Bringing It that each week features something that's working, working at you know at this level of ho holistic change. We talk about it at ACU conferences, but. I, I've mentioned a couple times this idea of movement building, and I actually think we need to be much more robust in building networks where we are feeding each other, learning from each other, doing collective action beyond the level of the kind of great institute lab where we have projects, we meet for a while, and then we go back to our separate worlds. We need we need to build networks where like two years from now, Meredith, you and I are still gonna be in relationship with one another and you're gonna to bring to your campus what we're doing and I'm gonna learn from you that, that we're building a network that aims to be larger and longer. Mm -hmm. So that, I think that's one of one of the answers uh, to it. And I'll just say um, our, co our colleague and friend, Peter Felton and Leo Lambert, their book, Relationship Rich Education, mm -hmm. which I think is actually getting huge um, uptake across higher ed is has a lot of those really important and good stories that, that influences our work in the project. I just want to echo that piece of, about the building of relationships um, and the relationships that give you, that offer affirmation. Because again, you may be in a situation where you are doing great work, but for a variety of different factors, the institution is not able to sustain it or to um, resource it in the way that it should be resourced. Uh, and I think that there is something incredibly powerful, at least from my own experience, certainly as a result of the pandemic and then having to navigate this virtual Zoom world where I've been able to be in touch with other people who are, have similar right. thoughts and similar experiences and are telling me and affirming me that you are, and you are not one who is, you haven't lost it. You are on the right path, right. keep going. Some of these people are on the screen right now. Um, mm -hmm. And thinking about where I am in my career and um, someone commented uh, a few days ago, they, they called me a creative and they wondered how I had gotten to where I was as a creative because Sometimes the system really works towards stomping out the the creatives, mm -hmm. um, and I'm kind of mm -hmm. watching that and fighting against it for my own children now in terms of how they're navigating space. Hence my research project that I'm going to take up. Um, but the ways in which we are embracing technology, along with these conversations and the movement building pieces of the Paradigm Project is, uh, I think, allowing that network to really flourish and not just a connection, but truly the, the other benefits of those relationships, which is the fact that you can, in some ways, see yourself and see that you are really doing what you need to be doing. Um, and that's what, again, goes back to that piece around hope, um, hope as well. And so there's a piece of this that is word of mouth as well in terms of getting out the 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 information. Um, uh, but it's the mirror, right? Uh, the reflective self coming back at you saying, you're okay, you're where you need to be and you're doing what you need to be doing. Brian, I'm trying to resist this, telling this short story, but blame it on Buffy because she brought up her kids. And you know, it's like, ah, I, I mean, I have, I have a, my youngest daughter is in, in graduate school. I'm not going to name the school, but she, she recently had a, a situation where um, she was um, at the institution and Brian, she went to the bathroom and, um, you know, some someone was coming out and the, the person that was coming out saw her and screamed. Ah! Right. And so Jamila and I are now in a conversation after that. She says, Poppy, do I, do I make this place scary? Right? I mean, it's hard enough to be a molecular engineering PhD student, right? <laughs> it's hard yeah. enough to be a woman in STEM, right? In 20 yeah. freaking 24, right? And to not be loved back, to not be affirmed for, the contract that woman is probably going to space. My wife and I have determined that you know she's an astronaut scholar. Do you follow what I'm saying? But it's the small-mindedness. It's the 
you know, the consistent mm. attacks on, on, you know, the way we can sit in our humanity together that um, I think are, are, are some, some too often understated with respect to how we do this work. And, and I just really was inspired to, to share that brief, brief story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Meredith, thank you so much for the great question. And th thanks to Buffy and Tim for the, for the great answers. Um, friends, if you're, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a video question. So you can tell, you don't, you, you, you don't have to be shy. Um, you can join us just by clicking the raised hand button and you don't even have to have a beard to be on stage. Although apparently it, it, it helps a little bit. That was really cool um, though. That, that, uh, <laughs> that video, video, I hope somebody else will do it. That was really cool. Yeah, All right, we know people here, so maybe we, we call you out too. <laughs> well, before before you do that, before you do that, we have a, a, a question that came in from somebody who couldn't make it today because of a prior commitment. Uh, but they asked a question, and I I don't remember if we've talked about this in the Paradigm Project so far. This is from Rebecca Rotundo, who is an architect, and she says, I would love to hear about how we can address justice and equitable policy universally across all facets of the college experience which includes the built environment. In my experience, the realms of design and support of the built environment uh, and the area of overlapping socio-emotional experiences rarely overlap, but I think it's crucial that conversations that address systemic change must include every facet of the student experience, including the built environment. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm curious what, what you think about that. Uh, what, I got to jump in here. Literally really, mixed space. Real quick, we, we have an $80 million building project that opened three years ago and was designed very carefully with uh, this notion of a, having a social corridor in the building. There are four lounges on each floor. We have smaller rooms so we can push students out of their rooms into conversation spaces. Mm. And um, mm. the designer that we worked with, RBH Group, was really, really uh, mm -hmm keen on working with us to achieve exactly that. So uh, come visit us at Rutgers University in Newark so you can get a good uh, example of, of, of um, you know, what kind of design with, with social um, purpose in mind looks like. So One of the things we've... people into... Go Sorry, ahead. Brian. Go ahead. No, you first. No, I was just sorry. So, so one key feature that is pushing students into space with each other. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, and universal design is obviously a really important part of that. Um, I was going to say that's a perfect example of, of a larger issue we've talked a lot about in the project, which is that some kind of important change, some kind of important innovation happens in a particular kind of issue area. Um, and if left to itself, it'll be good, but it'll be incremental. You build a good, good building or you, you, know, you add counselors to the mental health center. The important thing is when you ask, what are the larger implications of this particular incremental change? What does building the building have to yeah. say about inclusive relationships yep. or the way faculty and staff think about their connections to one another? And it's, it's that boundary crossing imagination where the place you start leads you into new conversations For sure. uh, with others, including conversations with architects and facilities, mm -hmm. folks who are typically excluded in a siloed university. I think that oh, there's also point. a conversation around how the design of the, just the built environment also engages the community around the university as well. Uh, yeah. So just thinking about my work in the Black Lumen project, one of the things that we realized in doing this kind of historical analysis of the black experience uh the black experiences uh was that even though the infrastructure on the campus was a lot of times not there or not where it should be um there the students the faculty and staff relied heavily on the the kind of collection of spaces particularly churches in the community that mm -hmm. would offer those relationships, offer those points of anchor and refuge and, and build up. And so then you think about, well, what's the accessibility of the community to, to, mm -hmm. the, to the campus? Mm -hmm. um, how are we, what are the invisible barriers that yeah. and boundaries that we, yeah. we, we create? And how do we need to think about that as well um, when mm -hmm. thinking about paradigm mm -hmm. shifts? Uh, because again, 
you know, I go back to the fact that certain students, when they leave the bubble, it's a quite, it's what I call the microaggressive whiplash. Uh, (laughs) When you are, you know, underneath it. uh, And um, how do we make sense of that? Uh, and um, how do we think about that in terms of the faculty and staff and the ways in which they yeah. are engaging um, engaging the space? Um, and also considering the fact that I think there is a big push for institutions to now move beyond just the, the specific campus to more thinking about more the satellite and other offices and locations, you know, space is, and, and design is becoming much more important as we think about the ways in which we're moving into the future. Mm, beautifully said. It, it, you all have fans in the chat. People are are, are double plussing what you said, and they, they've added more. Um, in uh, our, our friend John Hollenbeck uh, points us to Jane Adams, who had a model for community education a century back. Um, and uh, our, our dear friend Roxanne Riskin, who multitasks like mad, takes the best screen grabs of anybody on earth. Um, <laughs> she's, she, she keeps emphasizing that we focus on well-being uh, and compassion yeah. Uh, yeah. as we do this. We, we have time for one question, and this is a really fascinating question from uh, an awesome, awesome person. This is from Steve Ehrman. And Steve asks a question about, this, this has to do with the adoption of new innovations. Um, and this, this is a deep one. So I think we have we each have time to take a to take a whack at this before we run out of time. Uh, uh, Steve says that uh, oh, let me hit the right button. Uh, regarding the change of mindset at Rutgers, new perspectives only spread widely if there are some advantages people reap if they act according to the new assumptions. Do you agree? And if so, what advantages do people have? Here, I'll, I'll bring it back up so you can see this. Yeah, I think we, even though it's uh, directly um, directed to me, we can each take a whack of it. My whack will say, um, <clears throat> I think that, um, you know, what we're seeing here really is more about, um, you know, about a score of energy and work on the ground uh, from faculty and staff, you know, who had built a, a kind of a, um, a, a um, an ecosystem uh, uh, around um, <clears throat> affirming the 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 urban campus and a leader who recognized that um, you know Nancy didn't have a magic wand. In fact, if you look at you know the things that that she was able to achieve, much of it had already been proposed years before, right? And so yeah, yeah. you know th- there's a way in which um, it may be about deferred reaping. I don't know if that's the, the right way to put it. But um, also, I think so much around change has to do with um, the spade work and the, the folks that are often not um, in view. I'll stop time. Maybe I can hear from some other colleagues. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. David, Buffy? David, I'm going to let you jump in first. I'm OK. Still this is a great question, Steve. Thank you. Um, and one answer is that the level of it's part of the craft of change to construct rewards and incentives to uh, to meet, make it so that people don't have to swim upstream to to do positive change. But I would say more more deeply, the moment that we're in, we hear this all the time, and not just from people who are gung ho for big innovation is a moment where people feel like the values that brought them into being educators are not, they don't get to live them every day. And in fact, they feel demoralized Mm. uh, and exhausted. Mm. And in that situation, I think the problem isn't what advantages will I have with change? It's that I know the situation isn't good, but how do I know it won't get worse if we undertake Mm. change? And so it's that collective commitment to working together, mm-hmm. grounded in our values, that I think will remind people that their sense of identity will be nurtured um, alongside the, the tactics of making sure people get rewarded and that they're good incentives. Mm, beautiful. Well said. So I, I don't know if I can add anything more than what these two, what these two giants added, and I got a soundtrack to go with it. Um, <laughs> now the pressure is on. <laughs> uh, 
but I think a few things just come um, come quickly to mind, which is I was in a, uh, a webinar yesterday for women of color leaders. Uh, and one of the things that I was reminded of was someone said that the very things that you did to get you where you are may not be the things you need to continue doing to you oh. know, um, as a call oh. to really reflect on the behaviors and, you know, the ways in yeah. which we approach situations and how, as we continue to grapple with greater things, taking that approach of, I have to be the best, I have to be the shining star, um, you know, everything has to be amazing and perfectly lined up, maybe working yeah. to disadvantage and my, my advantage. And so it did cause a moment of reflection. And then I think I'm just going to bring it back to, and hopefully this fits because you said mindsets. And so it's making me think of, you know, my background I, uh, in graduate school, I worked with Josh Aronson, uh, who was contemporary with Carol Dweck and who was at Columbia at the time. So mindsets are a thing very, you know, the discussion of mindsets is very near and dear to my heart. Um, and in many ways, it's informing that research that I talked about. And so if I could just take a little bit of time to just unpack this and hopefully a little bit of time. Um, it is very clear that as a result of going through the pandemic, that the 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 children of my the the generation of my sons is struggling. And we all can agree on that. And those are the students that are going to be coming in the next decade or so into higher education. And so we need to be preparing for them. And one of the things that I did not expect was the fact that there is a loss of filter or sensor in it, when it comes mm. to comments and, and perspectives and beliefs that are shared freely. Um, but there's still a pressure to not respond back and not let it get to you. And so you tend to internalize it. And when we go back to that thread about well-being, that's part of that. What are the ramifications of that? Um, and so even though I know that they are struggling with the ways in which they are approaching this, there is a hesitancy to call it what it is, because calling it what it is means that they have to let certain people in their life mm. go. And as young kids, they may not be ready to do that. And so instead, this is why I said, let's use the game of chess. And what I'm trying to do is create kind of a moment of cognitive dissonance, right? Mm. Like if I'm asking them to use, to apply chess to the ways in which they think about uh, this ways they think about what, navigating racial trauma and they have to learn that enough so that they could be able to teach it to somebody else in order for them to believe in order for them to be successful in teaching it to others i think there's an element that they have to kind of internalize themselves and so i'm hopeful that this will start to shift their mindsets whether they know or not and so maybe a, perhaps a radical kind of vision of this is it's not about advantage, but it's about creating a cognitive dissonance that is so powerful that yeah. the only way through it mm. is to go with the shift that calls that it that is that is being called for. Powerful. That's quite a quite a description of how we can move forward, Buffy. Um, that's a very, very deep way of rethinking what we're doing. I mean, that comment alone um, makes me glad that, that we've had the three of you here. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but the clock has run out and, and probably fallen over a bit. Um, uh, it, it's been an absolute delight to host the three of you um, uh, as, as, a, as a first conversation in this uh, Paradigm Conversation series. Um, I'm, we just hit it out of the park. Um, the, let me just quickly ask, what's the best way to keep up with uh, all three of you and with the Paradigm Project? Uh, I think uh, I'm probably the, the best point person because I'm, I'm director of Bring Theory to Practice and, and one of the organizers of the project. Uh, my email, I'll put in chat right now, is scoby at bttop.org. Org. Uh, if you, uh, there are some pretty concrete ways folks can get involved, including joining the Change Makers Network, <clears throat> and also signing up for to be on our listserv, which communicates every couple of weeks. My colleague Todd Rosendahl put it in chat. 
uh, earlier. Um, uh, and we are, this is the first of a monthly series, as, as you said, Brian, and it's really meant to open up a set of conversations up on different themes about what paradigmatic change means. So I hope others will, will continue to be part of it. This has been wonderful. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Buffy, Tim, how do we keep up with you all? Assuming we can. Well, I mean, you can you can definitely find me on LinkedIn uh, because I'm usually posting there uh, different things that I am engaged in. So um, I think you have our LinkedIn, but I'm pretty sure there's yeah. only but one Buffy Longmire Avital in the world. So I'm not that. I would bet there. good money on that. Yes, yeah. yes, and and Tim Tim shared his email. Um, thank you, thank you, all three of you. I'm I'm really looking forward to hearing more from you, and uh, and I'm going to follow up with each of you with questions and irritating comments. Thanks for your leadership, um, thank Brian. You. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank all. you, Brian. Um, Thanks for this part. David, much love. Appreciate y'all. Back at you. But don't go away yet, friends. Let me just uh, formally wrap things up by thanking all of you for the really really good questions. Um, I mean, this is, uh, uh, first of all, that's just a delight and uh, for the discussion we've had throughout. If you'd like to keep talking about this right now, just hit the socials, as they say, use the hashtag FTTE. You can see all kinds of ways of connecting with me there, including on my blog, brianalexander.org. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions, including the first one, we introduced the Paradigm Project, uh, as well as on topics including racial justice, just go to our, our um, archive at tinyurl.com slash ftfarchive. If you'd like to look at our sessions coming up, including our next Paradigm Conversation, just go to the forum website, forum.futureofeducation.us. And above all, thank you for being with us for this terrific hour. It's uh, always a delight to talk and think with all of you. I hope everybody is safe and well, and we'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye.